Hi guys, welcome to the video. If you caught my last video, and I'll put a link up on the, up there I think, or is it up there, it might be up there. Um, I'll put a link to that video. And towards the end of that video, I said that I'll be looking at to see if we can get some later firmware to run on the Arduino Mega. Um, and also to update the uh, Gerbil Hotwire controller program to work with it. Well, I'm glad to say after some long hours, and I've quite enjoyed it as well, I've managed to get it to work, and I've been running it for a few days now, testing various parts of it out, and it all seems to work uh, really well. So what, what does the new program and firmware give us? Well, to start with, um, end stops or limit switches, uh, as they sometimes call. Uh, I have quite a few guys ask me if the older firmware can work with that, and it, and it couldn't. And the only way you could really get that to work was to you know, go out and purchase Dev CNC Foam, which, by the way, is a brilliant program. Um, you know, if you can afford it, I highly recommend that you uh, purchase it. So the other thing we, we've got, we couldn't get working on the older firmware with what's called G93 mode. And that's used uh, a lot in uh, DevWing Foam and uh, DevFuzz Foam. It's, it's really good if we've got, you know, swept wings and that. So, and the older firmware didn't support that. Um, I've also got it to display jetty cut files properly, uh, which were in incremental mode. And um, if you saw my last video, you'll see what happened on that. Um, the display was garbled, but the, uh, it actually cut them okay. And I've also tidied up the interface quite a lot as well. Uh, there was a lot of things in there that didn't really apply to foam cutting, like coolant and you know, a few other bits and pieces. So I've moved things around a bit. And also it's, it's helped fix the issue which we have with older laptops on this smaller resolution screen. So if this sounds interesting to you guys, then I'll, I'll give you a rundown of the software, show you how we install it and get it configured. And then we'll do a, a, a run through on the foam cutter. Right, so what we'll do guys, we'll just give you an overview of the program and how it's changed. So you can see if it's really of any uh, value to you. As I said, the old program still works but I think you might find this that does a slightly better job. So I'll go into the installation configuration uh, later on in the video, but so we'll just have a look at it now, see what it looks like. So first thing you notice when you start up, these preview boxes might be different sizes. It's, it's just to do with the screen resolution. Um, I wanted to get the program out as as quick as I could and there probably are some fixes for that but I may look into sort of doing a, an updated version where it fixes that but all you can do do is you can just move it so that they're roughly equal it's only a preview of where the wires going so it's not, it doesn't have any impact on the way the the phone cutter runs so as you can see the interface looks a little bit different so what I've tried to do is remove stuff that I didn't think was relevant to phone cutting I put settings in that were a bit more appropriate to foam cutting. So in the feed rate here, we had a setting of 3000, um, which was far too much for foam cutting. So I've reduced all these, got rid of some of the states that didn't make any sense, like cool and, and you know, things like that. And there was offsets as well. Uh, offsets are very useful in a CNC router, but they're not really much use in a foam cutter. So uh, I've got rid of them as well. And if you have a look at here, the I've slightly renamed some of the buttons. So we've got the unlock button, which doesn't really come into play till we're using homing uh, with limit switches. Then we've got the reset and we've got the stop button there and the space bar also works on the stop as well. So if the foam cutters all of a sudden started doing something you didn't expect, just press stop or press the space bar and that will stop it immediately. And you know, you can deal with whatever's happened. So the, check button, so the check button's quite useful because what that does, that actually runs through the code without moving any of the axis. So it'll run through it all and make sure there's no problems. So you don't want to get sort of, you know, through a, a 900 line program and get to line 850 or something and there's a problem and it just stops. So this, this will go through and check it for you. So we'll, we'll show you that working. At the moment, the homing cycle button is greyed out because at, on the, this little demo rig, I've, I've not got it set up for limit switches at the moment. So we'll just go to the settings page and show you what's changed there. Um, so what we've got there, uh, let's, uh, so what we'll do, we'll just connect first of all. So we'll, so we're on COM4, so we'll just connect. 
there we are and we're in a state of idle at the moment so if we go onto the settings page there and it pulls all the settings in now you'll notice there's a lot more settings on this version the old version went from uh, zero to i think dollar 23 i think or 21 can't remember offhand um but we've got a lot more settings here i mean it, there's not every single setting here but it's just the way on the version 1.1 of the uh, garble uh, controller it's it's done its uh, settings differently so uh we'll go through them as well through the settings and what we've got down here as well i've put in a limit switch status now at the moment because we've not got limit switches enabled that's grayed out but that's quite useful for when you get your limit switches set up you can just uh, trigger the limit switch and it will show you it working with a tick or, or without a tick so that's quite handy to make sure before you start using limits that's that's working i've also moved to here the ramps input voltage um, if you remember on the old interface there was a there was a little um, dialog box there where you could put the input voltage it, I, it, it was mainly put there for working out this percentage figure here it didn't have any bearing on the actual temperature that went to the wire so um, on the ramps board you can you can use 24 volts as well uh, i think you have to do a few changes first and i wouldn't recommend it for this because it's not not really needed but you could change the voltage there but it doesn't affect the actual current to the wire all it does is changes this percentage value here so if you move the slider up a little bit it's on 12 volts it will be a bigger percentage than it would be on 24 volts so it's only really for this display here um, as you might have remember from my last video, I, I don't tend to use this. Um, I don't find the control on it um, granular enough, so I, I use my eye charger, which you've probably seen. Um, and what I've also done is changed it so when the code's running, you can't change this temperature. Uh, on the older system, what happened if you tried to change the temperature as it was running, it would interfere with the G code and cause a bit of a mess. Um, now apparently the later versions of um, Garble are able to support that, but I don't think it's a good idea to change the temperature when it's running anyway. I, th I think it's better to check your current and temperature first before you set the, the actual controller going. So, uh, so when, we, when we do a, a run, you'll see that's, uh, that's greyed out. Um, so the homing cycle is greyed at the moment because we're not set up for homing. So we'll, I'll show that in a, in a bit when we've got homing on the real machine going and then I've just slightly changed some of the names of the buttons as well because we had home here which doesn't make much sense with home and cycle there so I've just changed these two so when you press that well it will go to zero x y go to zero and all and then the, the middle buttons is to actually set the uh, the zero as well so uh, and you can do it on the individual ones as well so this does it on the left carriage, that does it all, and that does it on the right carriage. So the other thing I've fixed as well is um, displaying jetty cut files correctly. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll just bring a jetty cut file in. So I've got one here. So as you can see, the jetty cut file displays correctly now. It was just to do with the way this this display was being generated um, and it actually it was relatively simple to fix so uh, that now now looks a lot better so as you can see we're running on this old laptop and we're not having any problems with the, the buttons disappearing so uh, hopefully that's uh, that's got rid of that issue as well one of the other problems we used to get as well um, sometimes when you connected you'd see a message in the in the display there and it's say bad bad format number um or something like that format bad number um that's that's disappeared i think that was actually an issue with the older versions of garble um but now i haven't had that at all now and as you can see in the display there when we first connect it comes up with the axes x y z and u so there are axis 
and in the settings page we've got the version of garble so you can see there it's it's 1.1 and a load of numbers there <laughs> So that, that's a new interface. I'll just, uh, yeah, this one should run okay, I think. So we'll just set it going and we'll, although it's not gonna cut anything, it will run through this okay. So as you can see now, the we're coming up on the display here. And I think with it being red over grey, it, it, it does stand out a little bit more. So, uh, so that works quite well. Now, if you thought something was going wrong, if you just press spacebar, then it immediately stops. So you could go in and uh, do whatever you needed to do. And if everything was OK, you can just press resume and it will carry on. But if there was something generally wrong, then what you could do is you could do a reset and then stop stop the code from going and then do a rewind and then we could do go to zero so that would take all the displays back to zero so that's going to take a little while there we are we're back to zero again the other thing you'll notice here we've got this the here Q that stands for the queue because the way the garble interface works it's it's got a buffer on the actual controller there and that's taking the commands in so what what you'll notice sometimes even though you've told it to uh, stop down here on the stop command so i've put some hints on these as well so they make a little bit more sense what they mean um, so on, on the stop there that will stop sending the actual G codes, but it won't actually stop um, the axis from moving because all it's doing is stopping any more commands going into the buffer. And what you'll see is gradually this blue will come further down here. This blue will come further down as the buffer starts to empty. And, but if anything goes wrong, all you've got to do is hit the stop command. And then when you're ready, you can see that it's got hold. And then we just press resume to carry on. So the other thing that's quite useful as well is this um, check button. So check the G code without running the machine. So if I just run that now and then press start, see what it's doing, it's running, running through the code and none of the axes have, have moved. So that's quite useful. Another option that's quite useful, especially if you're troubleshooting, and I've used it quite a lot, is this verbose and this is the actual messages that are coming back to the the program um, so the program works by dealing with these messages that are coming back so uh, so during troubleshooting it's quite handy to look at that so hopefully that looks uh, a little bit better than the older version so I have tested it with code from DevWing phone where it's using G93 inverse feed mode and uh, it works absolutely fine. So, uh, you know, I think it's um, it's a bit more suited to foam cutting and hopefully it should be uh, useful to you. So what we'll do now, guys, and we'll go on to actual how we get this working. Um, so there's a few different steps to get it working in the old version. So we've, before we start to install the firmware or the software, what we need to do is check that we've got the, the drivers in the right slots on the ramps board and if you'll see here we've got x y z and u i'll just bring that a bit closer there for you to see so we've got x y z and u now if you i've already used the older version of the firmware the x wasn't there and it was in e1 so what you need to do is make sure you move e1 into x and also any of the jumpers that are on there as well so we're using eight stepping on this. So make sure you, you move them across as well. Otherwise you'll find when you load the firmware up, you'll only have um, three axes working. So 
so they're quite easy to come out just very carefully pull them out and just put them into the correct slot if it's your first time just put them in in that that order there make sure you uh, you've got your voltage references correct for your stepper motors so let's get on to the installation and configuration so the first thing we need to do is install the new firmware onto our um, onto our mega and then once we've got that installed then we can install the the new application so to install the uh, firmware what, what we're going to need is the arduino software so just go up to the arduino.cc and go to the uh, software section and we need the ide now you can use this on windows mac or linux uh, we can actually upload the firmware onto the arduino with one of them but the actual application only works on windows so that's why i'm running this on a windows machine at the moment so download the uh, ide and just install it with, like you would any other uh, program and once you've got it installed then what we need to do is download the firmware so if you go onto the website and there'll be links in the description to download the uh, firmware now i've actually just downloaded it and put it on the desktop here so once it's downloaded just unzip it and what we want we want this folder here uh, garble so i'm just going to drag that out onto the desktop And then what we need to do now, we need to install this as a library in the Arduino. So we go on to, this is taking a little bit longer to go up because I'm running OBS to record it at the moment. So it's a little bit slow. Just close the program down as well. Right, so the Arduino is loaded up. So if we go along to sketch, and then include library what we're going to do is add zip library now even though we've unzipped the folder we still use this option here add a zip library in fact if you try and just up add the zip file to it you'll you'll get an error so what we'll do is now we we'll go to add zip library so we can see the bottom there it will come in at the bottom as contributed library so we'll go add zip library and all we'll do is we'll navigate to where we unzipped that folder and dragged out the garble folder so we'll go desktop and there it is garble there so we just select that and we don't get much confirmation but if we now go into uh, sketch include live we go down to the bottom now there we go contributed libraries we've now got garble in there now so this is slightly different to the old version so if you've if you've already installed the older version of the uh, software or, um, it's done a slightly different way so what we need to do now to compile the firmware what we do then is we now go to open and where we've Put that on our desktop so we go to the desktop and we'll, so it's in garble we go into examples then we've got garble upload and then we've got the ino file so we select that and as you can see here it says at the bottom do not alter this file so what we can do is we can first check to make sure that the firmware is okay and it's the usual thing we can just verify it first so if we do it so let's before we do that let's just double check we're on the right boards so make sure you've got the mega 2560 selected and we select the appropriate com port it doesn't matter for the verify but when we upload it will do so if we just click on verify if all goes well we shouldn't get any errors so you can see at the bottom it says compiling sketch and then you can see there that we've got the the icon has changed color so when it when it's done okay we should get a message 
as I said it's taken a bit longer on this because it's an old computer there we go so we've gone off there and then we get the message at the bottom there so we've got no orangey colored uh, yellow messages there so that all looks good so if you're happy with that then all we do then we just do the upload so we'll now upload it to the Arduino so this is where we need to make sure we've got the com port uh, where are we sketch get the right tools make sure we've got the correct com port selected and then what we can do then we can just do upload and what it will do it will actually compile it again as well so it compiles it then it uploads it so if we haven't got any problems so it's now saying uploading down in the bottom there and that's it. it it's done so we've got no error messages so what we can do to check that everything's gone okay if we just go into tools serial monitor and this is already set up for the correct ball rate and you can see it's it's come up there with um, Garba 1.1 so if we do a a dollar dollar that should show us all the settings so these are all the settings we, we, we've got in uh, and I think there's also a um, we just do a dollar for help and then I think if we do dollar dollar I yeah there we are on dollar I there you can see it's got the axis X Y Z and U so that confirms you've got the correct firmware on there if that said X Y Z and A it means you haven't got the configuration changes that's what took me a little while to get sorted so that, that firmware is now okay and we, sh we should be able to connect to it. So the next thing to do now is, it, is download and install the, the Windows program. So now that we've got the firmware installed on the board, what we're doing now is go on to actually install the Windows software to, to work with it. So there's a link in the description where you can download the firmware from. It's just on the website. So I've downloaded mine into a folder and extracted it into a folder called uh, which is 5x here and then all we need to do is just run the setup and just follow all the usual prompts and that's it, it's installed it starts up straight away so that's quite easy and what I've also done is close there I've changed the icon as well so it's a little bit easier to see so I've just called it 5x because it's based on the Garble Mega 5x uh, firmware so now we've got it installed what we need to do is go into the configuration and that's where we can take a bit of time so the next bit will go on to the configuration right so now we've got our Windows application loaded up what we can do is go through the configuration so We'll bring up the application and just full screen it and as you can see to start with if we go to settings we've got nothing there so we need to actually connect so make sure you're plugged in so we'll connect and there we are we're connected now so we've got the all the zeros there which means we're connected so we're going to settings now and you can see we've got all the settings now what we do first of all is just do it as if you're just gonna not have any limit switches or end stops uh, configured and then we'll do that as a separate uh, section uh, in a little bit so when you first install it if you've built the machine exactly like mine with the same threaded rods uh, same micro stepping you'll probably find that these settings will work uh, straight out of the box for you Probably the most common thing you're going to get is the axis going in the wrong direction. And the setting to change that is $3. Now there's a whole posting on the website. I'll just bring it up. Uh, 
I'm still working on this a little bit, so it might change slightly by the time you see it. Yeah. So we've got axis direction there. And basically all we need to do, we've got the axis here, so we've got X, Y, Z, or Z and U. And all we need to do is, if we find one of the axes is going the wrong way, just invert that axis by uh, looking at what needs to be inverted and then looking at the value. And that value is what we, we put in that dollar three there. So say for example, say we found that uh, we needed to invert the x-axis and the u-axis. So that corresponds to nine there. So what we would do then, go into the dollar three there and change that value to nine and make sure you hit enter once you've done that because if you don't hit enter it doesn't take it if you just click out of it, it although it, it looks like it's done it it hasn't and you can normally tell because it goes back up to the uh, top of the screen there so so that's the first thing to do is make sure your axis is going the right direction and you don't need to restart or anything it will just work what what we'll do after we've done this basic setup, we'll go on the machine and I'll show you that working. So the other thing you might need to change is the steps per millimeter. So if you've built the machine the same as mine using the threaded rods, the 10, uh, 10 millimeter by 1.5 uh, pitch thread, then uh, these settings will probably work fine for you. But quite a few of the guys have decided to use Lee screws. Um, and eight millimeter is quite a popular size in Lee screws. So you'll then find that this setting here, 1066, won't work. So a good resource for that is if we go, I've got it listed, yeah, there we are. So a good resource for that is to go onto the Prusa website for the 3D printers. They've got a thing called Prusa Calculator, high on the calculator. <laughs> and then if we go down, we've got steps per millimetre for lead screw driven systems. So what we need to do then is put in your, your values there. So generally we're on 180, uh, 200 steps per revolution. And then we can change our micro step. So if you're using different micro stepping, say you decided to use 16th micro stepping and you're going to use eight millimeter rods, then I think as you change it, yeah, it automatically updates as you change it. So if you were using 16th micro stepping with eight millimeter, then you would put that set it in. The only thing to be careful of here is that uh, quite often lead screws will have what's called um, multiple starts on them. And I think it's quite common to have four starts on a lead screw. Um, don't ask me how it works, it, <laughs> it, you know, it just does. So, so what you'll probably find is you'll need to alter this value again. So probably the thing to do is look in these pitch presets and on your uh, lead screw, it will probably tell you how many millimeters it turns per revolution. So, um, and what you can do then is if, if it's not listed there, then you, because these are uh, presets, you could put it in there. So if you find yours turns four millimeters per, per revolution, then that's going to alter that setting down there. So, um, so if you are using a different setup, that I, I use this resource quite a lot. People uh, come to me with questions about, you know, what, what do I do here? I'm using these, and I always point them to this, this website here. So this is really good, this is. So once you've got that setting, what you need to do then is come down into the uh, $100 to dollar 103 and put put that setting in there and as I said make sure you click enter and then if you're not going to use uh, limit switches or end stops that's basically all we need to do um, we should find it, ju it just works so what we'll do is we're onto live machine now and I'll show you that working right so now I've gone through all the basic settings what we can do is check that the axes are working in the correct 
uh, direction. Now what I've done is, I've, for demonstration purposes, I've purposely set up the U-axis to go the wrong way. And what I've also done is I've moved it off of the, moved it up a bit from the, the end of the uh, machine there. The reason for that is, so this is a standard flexible coupler. And these are two I've modified, <laughs> not on purpose. So what's happened is when I've had things going the wrong way, and it's before I had limit switches on, um, I've had it gone the wrong way and, not, and been too late to stop it, and it's just wound itself against the stop and then just pulled these apart. So you, you probably could still use them again, but, but, but I've got I ordered a spare set. So that's how they should look. So that's the reason to move the uh, axis away from the um, the end of the machine so it just gives you a little bit of leeway if it's going the wrong direction so what we'll do is we'll start the machine up and put some power on and then we'll connect Now what I suggest you do with this is when you first are testing it on the distance here, make sure you set it to one because what you want, don't want to have it is set to 50, hit it on the mouse and then it goes tearing off in the wrong direction and before you know it, it's ruined your coupler. So, because what can happen is when you hit these keys, if you're a little bit heavy on the mouse, it takes a couple of clicks and it does it does it sort of double or treble sometimes I've had it happen. So I've purposely set the U-axis to go the wrong way. So what will happen is when I just double click on the U plus, what we'll find is it will go the wrong direction. So U plus means it should come forward. So if I just do a, and you can see it's it's gone backwards. The numbers have said it's gone forwards, but it's actually gone gone backwards. So we'll just do that again. So it's got it's gone back. So what we do to change that, if we go into settings, and on dollar three there, um, the setting for this setup here is six. So if I put six in, so that's six. The axis go in the correct direction. So we'll just try that again now. So what we should find happen now is this comes forward when I do a U plus. And it don't. So what I've found guys is that you do need to um, disconnect and reconnect. So we'll reconnect. We'll do a U plus, we should go forward. There we go. What I found is it's a little bit intermittent. Sometimes it will do it um, without a restart and other times it, will, it won't. So probably the best thing really is to, once you've changed it, just disconnect and reconnect. So it picks up the new settings. So the other setting that we, we might want to change as well is down here in the steps per millimeter. And so, as I said earlier, you can work that out, but what you want to do is, is double check it as well. And what I use for it, I use this rule here and I clamp it to the machine and I'll just make a pointer up and I'll link you to the part four video where I'll show you how to do that. The process is exactly the same. So all we would do is we, I just make a pointer coming off there, going onto the uh, roll, and I set it to a point. And then what you do then is you go into the, do it via the MDI interface. Don't do it via the these arrows here because you can hit too many uh, mouse clicks. So, so on the U, if I wanted to check that it moved, normally you do it as a a good distance, um, so probably a hundred or even two hundred millimeters, and then uh, 
what you would do then. So on the U, we would put uh, G zero U. Uh, so if I wanted it to move, I'll just do 50 millimeters as an example. 50, and then we not need a feed rate. So I'll do a feed rate of 50, just a little bit slower. And all we do then is do send. So we're now showing 50 on you. And then what we do, we would then check on our rule then, if it's actually moved that, but you're probably better doing um, a much bigger distance. So if you find it's out a little bit, um, then check in the, the, the ebook and also on the part four video, and I'll, I'll show you how actually to work out the, uh, the settings. So it's probably more important if you have used lead screws rather than th threaded rods, because um, the settings for these lead screws uh, seem to work perfectly. And so that's probably, for a basic setup, that's probably all we need. Right, we're on to the next section, home in the limits, and you may notice a costume change. We're actually on another day now. Um, I had originally filmed this section, but when I looked back at the uh, footage, I wasn't overly happy with it, and I'd actually lost one of the files with it as well, so um, I thought I'd just do it again, uh, try and make a better job of it this time. So what we're going to do now is look at homing and limits and how we get that set up on the new software. But before you go into homing and limits, make sure you've got your switches installed and wired in and uh, using screen cable. Most of the problems you, you'll get with homing, a lot of them can be traced back to not using screen cables. And what can happen is because of the way the, the motors are running it and there's, there's lots of magnetic forces and they can induce some sort of false triggers into the wires. And so what you need to do is make sure you uh, use screen cable or you can use um, opto switches which are electrically isolated. So they work as well, but um, there's a little bit more involved. So I'm not gonna cover that in this video. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, I'll go through the setup with you and then we'll get onto the live machine. We'll, I'll show it working. So let's jump on the computer. So we just got the demo rig plugged in again. So we'll fire up software. So, so if we look, have, so if we have a look in settings, there's nothing in there because we haven't connected yet and the home in cycle is grayed, still greyed out because we haven't enabled it. So we'll connect. So at the moment it's just as we were before. So on the website, and I'll uh, create a, a new section in the ebook, there's all the details about setting up new software. So let's have a look how we do the configuration on the uh, homing and limits. What we need to do first of all is identify the pins we're going to be using. Uh, so if you've got them all wired in ready it's just worth double checking. So on the Arduino we're using, uh, I'll put this picture up a bit bigger as well, these are the pins we're using for the X min, Y min and Z min and on the new min it's just on this single pin over here. So I'll show you that on over on the live machine. Um, I did look in to see whether we could get the U over on here, but it, it meant a lot of changes in the configuration. And I, then I thought, well, because these pins in between are for the X max, Y max, and Z max. If you wanted to use um, uh, limit switches on the end of the travel as well, but uh, I haven't done that, and I'll show you why later because we, we use soft limits as well. So I'll show you the wiring of that when we got to live machine. So there's a quick summary of the settings here that we're using. Uh, and so what we'll do, we'll just go through these settings and what they mean. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set it to use normally closed switches. Now the general consensus of opinion is to always use closed switches. Um, the reason for that is if there's a break in the wire, 
and you operate in normally open, it, it will never um, it will never trigger because it, normally open it closes the switch. So if there's a break in the wire somewhere, it will never close. So you know, uh, so it's generally not recommended to, to use normally uh, open. I've always used normally closed on my machines, and it's always worked right. But to set that on the on the ramp spool and the Arduino, we need to set dollar five. So if we go and have a look at the settings, we go down here, and we've got this setting here, dollar five, just here, where it says limit pins invert ball. So we just change that to a one. By default, it's set to open. So we, we, we change that to one. So when you do change your setting on here, make sure you press enter afterwards. So if I just changed it back to zero, I think I changed the wrong one there, didn't I? Change that to yeah. So that's on. Uh, yeah. So just make sure you press enter. So it takes it, otherwise it, it won't take the settings. So that enables uh, normally closed switches. And on the settings page, once we enable home, and you'll see this come live then. Uh, and this is this gives us the status. So we can check the, the actual switches. So the next setting we, we need to change is to actually enable home in, and that's $1.22. So, so that enables homing, and what we've also got is dollar twenty-seven, and that's a pull off from the homing. So what we don't want when we when we home, and it comes back off the switch, we don't want it just sat there because what will probably happen is when it just comes back off the switch, it it could just move very slightly and trigger the switch. So we have a pull off distance there, usually between five and ten millimeter. So we'll go in and uh, check that check them on the settings. So dollar twenty two we change that to one, hit enter, and dollar twenty seven and that's its value here. And I've got five millimeters in here. And so if you wanted that uh, a bigger value you could put it in there. I wouldn't go any lower than five millimeters though, because um you know, I've been using five millimeters and I've not had any false triggers at all. So, and when we go back to the interface, you'll see now that the homing cycle button has become enabled and gone red. So it goes red to remind us to do a homing. Um, and then on the settings page, you can see this has become live now. Now, all these are ticked because it thinks the switches are all open and because I haven't got anything connected here. But when we go onto the live machine, what we can use this for is to check that each switch is triggering the right axis. So when we trigger the switch, you'll see these go, uh, well, they'll all be off on the live machine and then when we trigger them, they'll come on. So that, that's, that's a good test for when we first uh, get going. Right, the next setting we need to change is one called debounce. Um, sometimes what you can get is when it triggers on the switch depending on the quality of the switches sometimes it doesn't make a clean break and you get almost like a little bit of arcing going across the switch you know very minute but enough to cause it a false trigger so what, what you can do is you can put a setting in here and when I first started up with um, foam cutting I was using Mac 3 originally uh, with limit switches and I had, a, I had that problem and I, th and I was quite new to it then. I thought, what the hell is going on here? So I put a post in on the Mac 3 um, forum. <laughs> and within about five minutes, a guy come back and said to me, just change the debounce value and uh, put the debounce value in. And, uh, and I, think that, I think to start with, he hadn't got anything in there. And I put a small figure in there. And then it, it, uh, there was no problems after that. So the actual default figure in there Uh, where else we deep? There we are, debounce. The default figure there is 250 milliseconds. So if you're finding you were still getting a few uh, problems, then 
I would just try say up in that value, you know, just up it by say just double it to start with, so it's half a second or a quarter of a, you know, just go up in small increments. Don't like change it to ten seconds or something, you know, something like that. So that uh, I've let, I think that's a default setting within the, the uh, configuration of uh, the firmware, and I haven't had any problems with that at the moment. That seems to be running fine. So. So the next setting that we, you may need to play around with, and I did have this when I was setting it up, you, you set, set homing cycle, and then instead of going back towards the, uh, the homing switches, the, uh, it, it goes the wrong way. So all we need to do with that is we look at the same table as we did for changing the axis directions, and it uses the same format here. So if we found uh, X was going the wrong way, uh, we would just look for the values down here that correspond to which ones are going the wrong way and then put that value in. So I did find that was a problem. Yeah, $1.23, I'd forgotten what it was for a minute. <laughs> uh, $1.23. Yeah, so in $1.23, I've got the value one in there. So if we look back at the back at the chart, number one, what I actually found was that the x-axis was going the wrong way, but all the others were going, all the others were correct. So I had to put that value in there. So you just need to look at which ones are going correct and which ones are going, to, uh, are going okay, and then just put the appropriate value in. So that gets it going in the right direction. And then once we've got that, Once we've got that set up, then we can look at soft and hard limits. Now hard limits is for if you're going to use another switch, so you can have a switch at both ends of the axis. Um, you probably don't need it. When I, when I first started foam cutting with, with Mac 3, I had switches on the, um, on the homing and on the, um, the ends of the travel, uh, you know, the maximum travel. And to be honest, it, it, I never had it once trigger there, uh, only through testing to make sure it was working. Because usually when you're foam cutting, you're watching it anyway. So um, it, and it adds extra wiring and complexity to it. So um, you can use them if you want. So what you have to do is you have to change the setting. Um, so $1.20 we set for soft limits and $1.21 we, uh, we set for uh, hard limits. And when we set soft limits, all we do, if we go in and have a look. So if we set dollar twenty to one for soft limits, and then if we go down to dollar one thirty to dollar one thirty three, these are the maximum travels of each axis. So what will happen once it's homed, if you then tell it to go. Um, forward and it reaches that limit because um, it will know that within the software then it'll just stop and say and you'll get I think you get an error too I think on the uh, in the interface so so that's how I've got it set up here so really all you need to do is just once you've got your machine set up set it so it's it's homes and then just gradually bring it up until as far as you want it to go and note the value in that you've got on the, on the machine limits. So when we look here on the on the zeros there, the, the, the bigger zeros, that is work position. But these figures down below are actually the machine's position. So what we can do, it, and we'll, I'll show you this when we demonstrate it. When you move it, when you move it near the piece of foam, what you would do, you, you would then zero it. Um, but these values here will still represent how far it's actually moved. So the soft limits value is based on these machine positions, not the actual work, work coordinates. So if you wanted to use hard limits, you would set $1.21 to, uh, to 1, and then you'd have to wire in your switches, and you'd have to then wire them switches into these other 
these other pins. So in between the wire min and the X, I think there's the X max, so you would have to wire them in as well. But I, I wouldn't recommend doing it, doing that. I think you're just adding a lot of com, extra complexity for probably no gain really when you can do it with um, soft limits. Yeah, so that's, once you've got all, all them settings then the homing should work. Um, so we'll demonstrate it in a minute, it working. If for any reason you find it's, it's, it's not working, it's worth checking on the actual wiki that Ga Gauther has made. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Probably haven't. <laughs> so if we go on to the... Uh, let's uh, open it. So on his wiki there, he's got quite a lot of settings for the uh, for the homing. So if you found you were having problems with that, um, and I wouldn't try and change the speeds on it either, because if we look at the, there are some settings here to do with homing acceleration. And what I've done is I've used very similar settings to dev CNC foam. So I, unless you really have to, I wouldn't go and change them settings, you know, just change what you have to and you know, don't, don't, don't make it too overly complicated. So we're on the real machine now, and this is how we check our uh, limit switches are working. So you see the limit switch there, and what we'll do is we'll fire up the software, get the software up, and then we'll show you that little section where you can uh, see them working. So we just connect up. There we go, connected. And then we go onto the settings page. And then down in the bottom there, you can see them, that limit uh, switch status. And all we need to do is just go and trigger the actual switches and we should see it light up. So if I just give it a couple of little tweaks here, you can see the U working. It's quite difficult to get to the other switches, as, so I'll, I'm just showing you on this switch, but what you need to do is make sure you've got them all working before we go any further. Right guys, so we've got the uh, wire foam cutter set up. I've just put a camera down the back there so we can get some shots of the uh, homing. So we'll just demonstrate the homing at the moment, show you how it works. So I'm going to connect up launch the application power on the motors connect and there we are we've got homing cycle and you see it's unlocked it says unlock there so it's just reminding us to do a homing cycle so what we'll do we'll just do a So we'll just do a homing cycle, we'll just show you how it works. You see what happens first of all, we start off with the, uh, the Z-axis and it does it twice. And then we go on to the U-axis. So it does it twice and then it pulls it off that uh, five millimeter. And then we go we're across on the X-axis there. And then once it's done the X, you will then go on to do the Y then. So it's all home now. So what you want to do with your limit switches as well, when you're setting your limit switches up, just adjust them so that the, the distance between these stops of the uh, axis there and the foam cutter base are the same. So you, you'll get a consistent distance then. So as you can see now, it's all zeroed and we're unlocked. So what I'm gonna do is just move it forward a little bit, show you the difference between machine coordinates and work coordinates. So. Uh, I'm just gonna do it 10 millimeter. I'm just gonna do the 
jog both carriages. What you can find sometimes if you hold the mouse down too long, you'll, you'll end up doing 20 and 30. So as you can see now, what we can do now, we can zero everything. So this might be potentially where we want to be starting our phone cut from. So we can see the machine coordinates are on 10, but the work coordinates now are zero. So if we were to start our phone cut now, we'd be starting from that position. So when we've done, I'll not run this because uh, we don't need to run it. So what I'm going to do now is just rehome it. And you'll notice that the the figures don't uh, on the D, uh, the displays don't change at all, not until it's finished homing. I think that's part of the garble software. Now we are all back to zero again. So we're back to a known zero starting position again. So, so that's, that's the home in working. So what I'm going to do is just going to bring it forward again. I'll just do it on one of the axis. Uh, let's, do, let's do the U axis. Um, and we'll just go forward. I'll bring it forward 50. Hopefully it'll only go 50, unless I've hold the mouse down too long and it might go 100. Oh, got it. Right, now on the homing, we had this setting here, the home invert mask. And on, on this machine here, I've got it set at 15. So 15 corresponds to let me just double check yeah so 15 corresponds to i've had to invert uh, ev every axis for the homing direction right so if i change that to seven so if i do a homing cycle now we should find the u goes the wrong way so this is a situation you might end up in So in theory, the U should come forward instead of going back. Yeah, so you see it's going forward there, so it's gone the wrong direction. So all we'll do, we'll just stop that. So I've just done a reset to stop that. So if we go back, and if I change that back to 15, which is the correct figure for this, And then we do a unlock. And now if I do a homing cycle. So hopefully this should go back the right direction now. There we go. So that's gonna, so that's if you find it's home in the wrong way, just change that value. On dollar. 23 so just change it to the value that's going to give you the correct axis and as you see at home you'll see it'll just pull off a little bit so that's the five mil which is the dollar 27 setting
And we should find you. Should zero itself out. So in this next section, we're going to look at G93, which is called inverse time feed mode. And it's the mode that's preferred by software like DevWing Foam and DevFuzz Foam. And you can always tell it's uh, G93 because there's a feed on every single line. So here I am, I'm just home in the foam cutter and got some foam set up in the correct position. And I'm just going to load the file in. So this file is for a, a, a project I'm working on for a forward swept wing. And it's got uh, quite a large root section and quite a small tip section. So this is when G93 is really useful. So uh, just set it going. I have fast forwarded a lot of these sections because you know, watching foam cutting isn't the most exciting thing. So, so as you can see, it's coming well forward now. So this is the tip side. Just doing a couple of checks just to make sure everything's going as expected. And as you'll see later, um, didn't come out exactly as intended. <laughs> and you can probably notice at the bottom there's already a, um, a wing cut out. Uh, so I already tested it on one and, uh, and it worked out okay. So th this wing here has got uh, a spar, a square spar, and we'll see that later when it's finished. And, it, and it's also cutting a, an air along as well. So it's leaving a bit of foam there so we can uh, use it as a hinge as well. So we're almost done now. So this is one of the modes that didn't work on the old software uh, or firmware sorry and um, what would happen I had a few guys contact me and when it hit a G01 uh, or a G1 it just went extremely slowly and it's because the old firmware didn't support it but this newer firmware uh, does so um, we'll just take the sockets off and I've cut a portion of this out here really taking it apart there we go so it's coming apart now and it's come out quite well I'll just get the other one out I did earlier the only problem with it is I didn't get the foam in quite the right position so it just popped out of the top you can see that little flat section but um, apart from that it's done a really good job and I'll just get this square spar for it and I'll show you that fitting in. The previous one it didn't fit quite as well so I adjusted it in the in DevWing foam. Yeah so that's fitting quite well now. So that's a future project you might see uh, in the future. It's a forward swept wing. Um, I always fancy doing something like that so uh, we'll see how that goes in the future. So that's G93 mode working guys and uh, yeah, that was one of the stumbling blocks of the old software. So guys that brings us to the end of the video, another long one. Um, I hope the software is going to be useful to you. So please remember I'm not a developer, I've had some programming experience in, in my working career uh, but not as a full fledged developer. So please bear that in mind. If you do have any problems, uh, you know, just drop us a line and I'll do my best to help out. And as I said, I've only tested it on Windows 10 because I don't have any of the uh, older versions of Windows anymore. So uh, give it a try, see what you think, and do lots of testing. Yeah, as you'll see from the last section, I still make mistakes. So lots of testing without any foam in the wire off just to make sure it does what you expect before you commit any foam. So if you made it to the end of the video, guys, thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next video.